Hi, my name is James Taylor and welcome to Invalid Entry. Today we're going to be looking at maths problems from the 1950s. Uh, the, the puzzle I, I saw online, I saw one of the YouTubers uh, a few weeks ago presenting it, and I didn't feel that they did a very good job. I, I think they showed the puzzle, they sort of misrepresented the scenario a little bit, and then they just showed the solution. There was no real discovery or discussion about uh, the historical context or why this is a really interesting puzzle or why it has uh, a meaning today. Um, so basically the idea is you have a line of robots and you tap the one on the far side and they communicate down the line uh, to synchronise when they're going to perform an action. Uh, shoot the prisoner and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And the idea is, is you sort of tap the one left, a message goes down the line, they all get synchronised somehow and then they all shoot at the same time. Uh, like that. So um, that's it, that, that's the end of the video, right? So a few weeks ago, maybe three or four weeks ago, I was watching a, a YouTube puzzle channel and they presented this puzzle. And I felt that they, they didn't present the puzzle uh, in a particularly good way. They sort of skipped over some of the details of the puzzle. Um, I didn't watch the solution then. I, I actually went away and, and I solved it myself. I, I tried to solve it. I looked the puzzle up, actually the details of the puzzle, then I solved it. Um, then I went back and looked at the other people's solutions and did research on the puzzle a bit more. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to make this into an episode and, and talk about it. First of all, uh, the puzzle... In the 1950s, when these puzzles were, sat, sit, were set, um, mathematicians then, and indeed today, have a pretty sick sense of humour. Um, so all the puzzles are always... Things like you've been taken prisoner by a madman on a desert volcanic island, and you have to guess the colour of the hat that you wear but you can only see the other prisoner's feet and you only get to guess once a day. You know, it's all this kind of game theory. The setup is there to remove um, uh, obvious answers like look in the mirror, like uh, <laughs> just, just, just leave, just break out, dig a tunnel. Um, so, so for some reason this puzzle is a robot firing squad where you have a bunch of robots in a line and they all have to fire at the same time. I'm not sure why they have to fire at the same time. I wonder if it's the order to fire so no one knows who, who shot you and they don't suffer uh, psychological damage of being the executioner. Um, it's a pretty dark puzzle. It, it really is. But it actually has some really interesting real-world applications. Um, what's interesting about it is that these were the starting of cellular automation. Cellular automation, it, when we talk about it now, we usually think of like Conway's Game of Life. Um, and the idea is that each cell, or each robot in this case, has a set of strict rules and the cells don't move. Um, what's interesting is if you start looking at those sort of situations in real life, it becomes, oh, and they don't know how many cells there are, and they can only see the cells around to the left, to the right, or down, maybe one or two cells, but not very far. We start comparing that to real life situations, um, you may have things like uh, Zigbee networks, where everything is a mesh network, but you don't know how big it is, so you want to send a message to explore the network or things like, um, um, yeah, anything which is starting a computer. So you may have a computer bus of chain, daisy chain devices. Uh, you start the computer, but you don't know how many things are attached. You want to send a message down the bus and back it again and to find out how big the bus are. Now, most of those problems are solved in an easier way by setting a finite limit. So you can say, okay, I've written a practical solution that works up to 32,000 devices. Like, who's got 32,000 hard drives plugged onto one network bus you know other problems start coming at that problem like getting data all the way across but you do have these sometimes we do have uh phone networks in america or i think about mesh network the side the size of the world or if you've got spaceships you know you've got starlink networks as a mesh um so this problem here basically says you have a series of robots and potentially an infinite number but actually no it says it is finite but an unknown size so you could go beyond int max you know and your solution is to still work. It was set by a man called John Myhill here, uh, and it was first solved by these two gentlemen. Um, these two gentlemen are um, um, John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky. Marvin Minsky. Now, um, when I started to put this together, I was like, that name's really familiar, and these, these people are like the fathers of modern computing. Everyone on this screen is, is one of those pioneers in modern computing. Um, now, what's interesting is I don't want to dwell on these two. There's a bit of controversy, controversy at the moment about this chap um, and, and Richard Stallman. 
the reality is these are the two people who solved the puzzle first, um, and that's where their contribution to this story ends. Um, now, the interesting thing was that uh, the guy who published it is this guy. Um, Edward Moore is not the Moore from IBM, but he was the guy behind the Moore machine, the Moore state machine, who we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, he published the paper and he said these two, these two, he said it, these two solved it. And once they had solved it, other people found it easier to solve. So knowing it's actually got a solution means it's easier. Uh, this chap on the left, whose name I believe is Ichi Goto, and all this is, by the way, in my, my blog here. This chap solved it with the minimum time. So he, he said, here is a solution which will give you the minimum time from the please fire signal through to them all firing at the same time. Um, but his solution used thousands of states. And I couldn't find this paper. I, I have looked quite hard to find this paper. I found people talking about his paper. Um, and he basically says, I've got thousands of states. And I do wonder if he actually solved it or he solved it in his head and said, yes, this for this situation, this situation, I need these states and it's going to be this many states to be able to solve these edge cases. I, I don't know if he actually did solve it because I kind of feel if he had solved it, someone would have said his solution used 1,574 states, well, the thousands. No, so it makes me think that he solved it in a generic way, which is still a perfectly valid solution, um, but didn't actually come to a solution. But once he solved it, everyone else then optimized it, and it's now been optimized. The actual final solution should be optimized down to, you know, I believe someone's done it in eight states, which is insane. It's insane because actually it means this entire thing is unmaintainable. They basically optimized it and basically played code golf with the solution. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, um, state machines and what state machines are. Um, and I'm not going to give my solution uh, until a bit later on. I'm going to, what's going to happen in this video is I'm going to talk a bit about the situation, about the problem a bit more, about the context, the historical context of the problem. Then I'm going to uh, say, yep, this is the point. I'm going to start giving some hints. I'm going to show the methodology that I went through and then how to solve it. And the reason is because Moore himself says he doesn't want people to know the solution. He wants people to go and solve it. It's a puzzle, right? It's not just, oh, here's the solution. Um, but if you, if, there will be those hints how I went about this, thinking about that situation uh, because it will spoil the fun. And it was actually quite fun. Uh, he actually also talks about solving it in, on paper. Um, I solved it sort of in my head and then I wrote a program to simulate it so, so I can make a video. Okay. So, first of all, what are state machines? So a lot of programmers will think of state machines as uh, this diagram, okay? They'll think, oh, we use state machines all the time, like passwords, users are state machines. So you sign up to a website and you're unverified, then you go through verification and you're a good user until you type your password in wrong five times when you become locked. And there's a process to unlock it. And the reality is that is a state and it's a machine, but it's not a state machine. State machines are particularly particular meaning of that phrase has a particular technical meaning and the idea is is that they're electronic or physical or devices which actually have a state and the state defines the output so inputs cause it to change state and then the state is the outputs are triggered either by the state change or by the state it's in whereas this is a set of states and states are super powerful in programming we can do more than just state machines. You know, we actually are able to put through functions as other things going on in the program than just this state. Whereas the state machine, the state machine is the program. So this is a more state machine. This is the actual system diagram above it. So I've got a state machine in the middle. I've got three inputs actually. I've got a, 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 a switch, a temperature sensor, and also a button, an on-off button, which is on the diagram. And the outputs are the heat and the fan. And the idea is that the state machine can remember the state it's in, either because it has a signal per state or it uses a number or a counter to know which states it's in. So if you're in this state then if the on button happens then it goes into neutral no matter what the other signals are it goes into this neutral state if the temperature is above 18 it goes into the uh, sorry the temperature above 20 it goes into this state where the fan gets turned on once it goes this one they actually should say fan off heat off in, the, in this state and it basically the temperature drops too much it goes into this state where the, fan, where the heater comes on and the fan is off. Nice and simple uh, state machine. It's called a more state machine because the outputs are defined by the state you're in. Okay, so it's easy to understand if you're in this state, the heat is off. Right. A mealy state machine was defined as the the the, the outputs defined by transitions between the states. So you could draw the same diagram and then just put it on the transitions because there aren't that many transitions here. You could say yes, this is when the upper end is you turn the heat off, you turn the fan off. 
Um, but actually you can define it with less state. So a melee state machine is a bit harder to understand, but actually leads to more optimized numbers of states. And that's important because if you're using electronics and then trying to optimize your circuit, that having less states means having less lines, control lines, less memory elements. Um, state machines died because the way you make a state machine in reality is you define this, you don't give your states numbers, then you basically build a, a cutoff map or something so that to optimize the number of um, memory lines you need and to optimize your state transitions. Um, and then you'd build, physically build the electronic circuitry, which was the state machines using some form of memory like a relay or a, um, <laughs> I'd say a transistor, but actually transistors killed these, um, a valve or, or an iron bit of core memory or something to indicate what state you're in. Uh, with that system, um, you basically have to then build it using primitive AND gates and NOT gates to build your machine. And if you decide to change your program for some reason, add an extra state in, add an extra button, signal, something like that, you would then have to take your circuit apart and put your circuit back together again. So changing it became very so expensive. That was all destroyed by microprocessors. Now I can basically do a state machine in program code and even things like power control programs, which are effectively sort of like, you build state machines in those. Um, they actually just map that to a microprocessor code. You can build everything much easier in code, and if you want to change it, you just basically reflash a chip with a new program. So um, microprocessors, when you've got that, you're buying, you, you can make the same microprocessor millions of times and put it into lots of different machines, as opposed to building a unique state machine electronics for everyone, which is then very unwieldy. So state machines have died out because microprocessors are cheap and you can do everything with a microprocessor. But as I say, the, the, the challenge is to use a state machine, so we're going to use a state machine. I mean, these days, if I had a robot firing squad, um, then, I mean, I'd just use like Zigbee and just tear them all to fire at the same time and, you know, you time synchronize them. You know, the problem is easy, right? We've got the technology. But these guys didn't, and they said, we're using a state machine to start thinking about how these, how these solutions work, about how the signals work. And when you consider this is about a signal problem going down through an unknown number for discovery, for example, um, let's say I wanted to time synchronize all these things. That's what we're basically doing. So it, when they're all synchronized, they're all synchronized at the same time. Um, and what's interesting is at the end of this, we, we still don't know how many robots there are. That's the, the interesting side effect of this. Anyway, these are state machines, very easy to understand. Um, that's the limit. Now, the other thing about this, this problem is that we're not using full more state machines. They evolved a little bit after this problem was set. The the problem, we were told that the robots can see the state of the robots on either side of them, to the left and to the right. They can't see outputs. So you can't make like a um, two or three light bulbs and have the robots look at the light bulbs and therefore have the light bulbs a little bit independent from the states. They actually see the state themselves. And that's an important part of the puzzle. Um, I am going to do what the other YouTuber did and say, well, the states will be done by robots doing a dance. So if they've got an arm up, that means one state. If they've got both arms up, it's another state. If they've got one arm hanging down or leg up or leg down. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll sh you'll see that in a moment. So my solution was, the way I went about my solution was I started thinking about it in my head. I then wrote a, a bit of Python code to emulate a state machine and to pretend to be a row of robots. Um, and I'll show that code very briefly, and then I wrote an animation that used that state machine. So, uh, before I go into any more detail, I will show my, my code. All this code, by the way, and the blog post are on a link from my, my, on my website up, up there. So click that. Uh, and if you feel like clicking things, please hit like and subscribe. So, um, here we go. Uh, we're going to go straight into the source code here. So, the source code for the state machine is here. Okay, and it's a very simple, basically, each each robot is an instance of a robot state machine. And it's got a current state, it's got a program. So I could reprogram my, my robots very quickly rather than writing my, all my statements in Python. Uh, so basically what it does, it looks through the program for the current state, it drags the current state out of a dictionary, and then it basically looks through the, the, the rules of that state and says, do I state transition or not? We have a function called army tick, tick army here which basically this does a two pass on the entire array. So I have an array of robots. I go across and get the current state, and then I feed that into tick. So that the idea is that if you have a robot that changes state, 
the next robot on either side uses the, the state they wear in, not the state they just changed into. So the order I can update robots in makes it look like all the robots are updating in parallel rather than them being in sequence, even though they're being, obviously I'm processing them in sequence, but it makes it look like they're actually doing it on the tick rather than it being a bit weird. So a little bit of semantics there. When I first wrote this, I realized I needed to be able to program them easily, so I then invented a little compiler here and my own language. So my language looks a bit like this. Uh, some comments. I, I was thinking a bit like assembler stroke Python. And what basically happens, I've got two programs here. The programs for the privates. Oh, the other rule was that the robots in the middle all have the same program. And the robots in the end hang, can have a different program because they have to handle the fact they're on the end. They have to know they're on the end. So Because they go, oh, I've got no robot on one side. Um, I could actually merge the programs together by the way I've defined my state machines. but uh, Because I basically say if there's a state on, on one side, it gets a minus one. So on tick, each robot gets passed the value of the robot on the left and the robot on the right. And I do that by passing it in as a as a, as as two things. So left robot hyphen right robot. Like that. Okay, very simple. So all I'm doing for each state, this is the this is the, my start state, is I have a set of rules. And if it matches, so if the robot on the left is two and the robot on the right is one, go to state seven, that's how the program works. Okay, it's very, very simple to understand. But I wrote it as regex, so I could actually say, I actually don't care about the one on the right, I only care about the one on the left. So what this program here is going to do is, if the one on the left goes to a one, then I'm going to go to one. So it goes one on one state, and then on the next tick, it'll go, oh yes, it was at one now, I'm going to one as well. Once it's in one, on the next tick after that, it's going to go, I don't care what's on either side, dot asterisk means match everything. So it's going to go back to zero. So what we should see with this is a row of ones go across and they go back to zero every time. Um, and the, the way it works is that my little program, I hit space to trigger it, and then it will go to, um, it basically will send a signal across the line. Uh, and this isn't a good answer, by the way, uh, so I'm going to run that now. I, I also then built an animation so I could, um, the head's a little bob up and down, I, I, a sprite sheet animated it, but it used the same state machine. So originally I built this in Jupyter so I could look at the output over here like this, but, but I, I animate it after a bit. And it's going to do like four ticks a second and, and a configurable number of robots. So there's my signal going across the line. It looks fantastic. Um, program run. You know, job done. And they all sort of shrug. All right. Now, the, if I was to make them fire, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't meet the, the problem. The problem said I had to fire all at the same time. I don't know why. I think it's that they all suffer from um, crippling doubt. Um, and they don't want to be the one that shoots you. Um, as it guys above first law comes into effect. They can shoot you as a team, but they can't shoot you on their own. Uh, something like that. I don't know. Um, but that's what the rule is. So they have to shoot together. So if I said, yeah, fire, and they all fire like that, that would be a bad solution. However, it's still possible for an unknown set of robots to do it. Um, so, before I go any further, if you don't want any more hints, now is the time to stop watching. Um, however, if you do want some hints, uh, keep on watching. Uh, and also, if you do solve it yourself, uh, for free, all my codes on GitHub, you to, you, for free to use my system to, to test your solution out. And for free to also let me know how how you got on. And my solution is also checked in, so don't read my solution, basically. Uh, my solution has some holes in it, interestingly, which I will discuss at the end. So, we've seen we can pass a signal across the way. Um, what's really interesting is that I kind of want, I started, when I was solving this, I was thinking about what I could do with the robots, not necessarily thinking about any particular goal, just sort of going what I could do in my head, so I could pass it away, and I can bounce the signal off the end. That sounds like a pretty useful thing to do. Um, so in this program, what I'm going to do is, the signal over here on the left side is going to get to the end over here, and then I'm going to trigger a different state like I'm going to go to state 2 and then I'm going to say well if I see a 2 on my right when I'm back into neutral state then I want to go um, so let's go back to this bliss problem when I see a 2 on the right hand side then I actually want to go back again so this is my full program here it's a little bit complicated because it actually can handle all combinations of, of two or three signals at the same time going across I've got a state 3, 4 when they're passing over so I'm going to do bounce Ooh. I'm going to do bounce now. Um, and 
what you should see is the scene will go across, it'll get to the end, and it'll go back. And I notice I have to use a state two going back because otherwise, if it's a one, well, ones only go to the right, they don't go left. If, it, if, if ones went left as well, then as the one was here, then these would have been ones all the time. So we're using a one to go one way and a two to go back. And we go across bounce, and it will do that all the time. Okay, so now I've got ability to bounce signals off the end. That's pretty useful. And it's also why having a different program for your end robot is a little bit helpful to do. Um, this program is a bit more complicated because it deals with any combination. This, If I added another one in there now, um, it would bounce both of them. I could actually make them go like this at the same time. Um, but what's interesting is I don't need to. Because I know there's only ever one signal at a time on here, I actually can make my program a lot more simpler if I wanted to, to handle the fact that there are states it just can't get into. It can't get into a situation where there's two, this can't have a one on both sides at the same time. It can only ever have a naught and a one. Or uh, so it can only have a naught and a one, which I don't care. It can have a one and a naught, which I do care. Or it can have a naught and a two, and I do care. Or a two and a naught, in which I don't care. So there are situations, there are, there are states that I do care and states that I don't care, and then there are all the other states combinations like a one and a one on both sides just will never happen. Um, so yeah, this is going to run forever. Very interesting. The next thing I tried was how can I pass the signal slower? Um, and this one's a little more fun. So signal pass two basically has a delay. So what it's going to do is if it sees a one on my left, which is what happens I hit the space bar, it sees a one on the left, it's going to delay the pulse. Uh, it's going to go to the, it's going to go to state three. Three is going to go to state two, no matter what. Two is going to go to state one, no matter what, which is going to go to state zero. Well, when that goes to a one, the next one goes ah, that was a one, and it's triggered. So this is definitely a one, not any number on the left. This is definitely a one. Then goes to a three and counts down. So if I now do that, you can see all these lines are bzz, 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 like that. When I do it here, again. Ooh, Where's my milk? You sort of do this little dance thing. And I'm afraid uh, I'm just going to stop that second because here that should go back to zero. And I'm just going to take that line out there. I'm not sure why I left that one in. Um, in fact, I'm going to take both these lines of code out because they're not needed. Right. Here we go. Run that again. It's not going back to zero. Why is it not going back to zero? It's dot, if it's dot one, it should go to zero. Oh, I didn't save it. Uh, does that work? I'm on single pass one. Ignore me. Ignore me dot asterisk goes to zero. There we go. Load the program. The signal now passes slower through the wave. So I can now pass signals at different speeds. And you can see there I've got a line going through much more shallow. This one doesn't bounce, but it goes through much more shallow. And I could change the, num the speed that signal goes at. I can send it at speed uh, two, three, four, five times slower. It's always going to be an integer. I can't say it one and a half times slower, um, but I can send it through at any integer speed through the wave, just by having more states. Um, I can't do a counter because that's not a state machine, so I can't say, go into this state, count down from five, then move into the next state. I could if I was in normal programming, but that's not a true state machine. So we use these states as delays, and that's one of the optimizations we can start, start talking about. Because you can look at the states either side when you start saying, oh, can I optimize these states out? You can actually duplicate the use of some of the states. Now I've got the ability to send signals through, I started thinking about what that meant. And I realized that I, I, to get to a firing state, you wanted to fire a robot when the robots on either side of you are about to fire. And all the robots need to be in synchronized. So you're basically getting to a point where all the robots are in the same state. You can't set it going across because you don't know how far you've got to go. You don't know how many robots are. You can't count down, and I'll give you a countdown demo. The countdown demo using that as a signal is really good. So basically, I'm going to start by counting at 10. I'm going to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then I'm going to fire. I'm going to use minus 1 as my fire. And it actually goes bang. So if I use my countdown method, um, 
that's called countdown. This won't work for many cases. It will work here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, bang, ignore the ones at the end. And you say it worked, they all fired at the same time. You can see here they all fired on the left here, bang on the same <laughs> bang on the same time. However, if I get rid of this and then say actually I want to run more robots, so I'm gonna increase the number uh, not robot, I'm gonna run me. Increase the number of robots up to 16 robots. Save my file. Then all of a sudden, what we have here is the robots are counting down. It's all going really well. And then the half of them are fired and half of them haven't fired, which is a failure. So this has, because it's a finite state machine, a finite number of steps that will count down. I don't know how many robots there are, so I can't make my state machine big enough to account for that. It also doesn't fire at the shortest time. It always fires at the 10th. So if I have three robots, there's a lot of wasted time before it fires. This isn't a good answer. It doesn't meet several other conditions of the puzzle. Um, so we can discount that one. However, so I can't do anything which is just setting the rows across. I'm going to have to go all the way across and come back. That That's fundamental to the thing because you have to get the first one, know that the last one has been told because you don't know how long it is between you starting before the order to fire has been given, you see. So you've got to measure all the way across and all the way back, which means the minimum time possible, no matter what solution, is going to be 2n minus 2, okay? And it's minus 2 because you can actually ignore the ones on the end, in that when you get to just short of the end, you can actually go, ah, that's the one on the end. And so you can you don't have to bounce off the end, you can actually bounce off one in from the end. And similarly, when you're coming back, you don't have to get all the way to the end, when you get just pit short of the end, you can then go, ah, the one goes, yes, I know where I am now. So your shortest time is 2n minus 2. Um, anything else is possible. Anything higher than that is also possible. Um, so I will show you what I was trying to do. My went down the route of thinking, what I want is, I know I can set this signal off here. I was thinking, what happens if every five became like a sergeant? And I basically can work out all my sergeants, then synchronise all my sergeants by passing messages in between them. Um, and I thought about that for a little bit and I realised that when I started evolving that idea that I ended up with more and more sergeants. And I thought, oh, okay, what I need to do is work out the middle one and promote that. And once I promoted that to being a sergeant, uh, I then promote the ones in between. And somewhere along the lines, I stopped calling them sergeants and I called them general. So this was a general. And I would say, if I could work out the midpoint and split this in half, then I can do it again. I can basically then trigger the process off again and split it in half again because if I can solve it and find the midpoint, I can solve it and find the midpoint and solve it and find the midpoint. So the first question is how to find the midpoint. Well, it gets quite interesting. If all you can do is send a signal across, you actually can find the midpoint quite easily. And I now present to you another diagram from the left. Okay, so... I'm going to zoom in on this one quite a bit, if I can find my zoom. Here we go. What we can do is, we can send a signal all the way across, bounce it off the far side and back, and send a slower signal that we know will meet in the middle. Okay? Pretty simple. So if you imagine how far this signal has to move, it has to move 1.5 widths. Well, this only has to move 0.5. So if this is the fastest signal we can send, that's going to be speed 1 then this thing is going to be one third the speed. And it will meet in the middle. Because this is moving three halves and this will be one half. That's move at speed delay three. This one moves at speed delay one. It'll meet in the middle. Um, so we'll write that up as a program. And the mid finder is here. So what we have is effectively two separate sets of states. We basically has the fast pulse, which is state one. If you see a, if you see a one, go to one. Uh, but if you see um, anything else, basically, um, you've got to also handle the fast pulse coming back, which is going to be a five. Otherwise, you're going to go to the slow delay, and the slow delay is going to go two, three, uh, two, three, and then four, which is it just knows it's that slow delay. And on the four, it's going to go trigger the next one, to, which will, the next one will be the one because the one's gone across already, that will trigger the slow delay to go across as well. However, 
if the slow if the fast ones come back, it won't it won't be in a four anymore. It will be in a five. At that point, you know the slow delay has hit the five, and we're going to go to minus one. So at the moment, I'm just going to go to minus one um, in the middle, and it will just as, as this isn't this isn't attempt at all. I'm going. This is just to find the middle ones. So I think this is on 16 at the moment. I think I've got 16 robots here. And the first pulse goes across here. The second pulse is coming across much slower. You can see on this diagonal on the left, it's coming across, it's coming across. And it's going to meet there. And the one in the middle goes bang. All right, it worked. This is, this is it working. We've, we've got a solution to find the one in the middle. All we have to do now, instead of going to bang, is actually say now trigger the process again and fire a slow pulse, a fast pulse, both left and to the right. And also go into... Um, uh, do it again and again until we're finally all synchronized and once we're finally all synchronized you know because you've got a general on either side of you so if you're generally either side of you you know this general's now crossed the entire thing so this shape here this sort of triangular shape matches this shape here it's bang on so we can start to visualize that what we're going to start end up having is at that top shape followed by two bottom shapes like that Followed by then we split the shapes out again and we end up with two more shapes and two more shapes until finally everyone's synchronized at the same time. Um, and that is actually one of the first short solutions. Um, the solution I have here does exactly that. Uh, for 16 robots you see the fast one going across, it hits the far side and comes back and it promotes the two in the middle, both of these to being generals. And then you see it again, going back and forth, then you get two more generals, then two more generals, and it's done. Solution, that is that is the one of the fundamental solutions. Um, and they've all fired at exactly the same time, and I also coded the generals to fire at the same time as well. Now, my solution for the solution uses, it doesn't use 16 states because I jumped a few numbers at the top. It uses uh, 14 states, plus a few less for the sides. And also, I've got a few extra states for, for banging, for the explosion for the animations. Um, for those of you using, by the way, in the robot um, class, my robot, not my robot class, it maps these states to actual poses, um, at which if you use different state numbers or, or names or strings for states, you'd have to modify that dictionary to get the animation to work. Uh, so these are my states, and basically that is how it works. I've got these right-hand general, left-hand general states. Um... As a state diagram, um, I also built a bit of code to actually graph my states to sort of show what was going on. Um, so you can we can use that as well. So this is my actual state machine, the program, not written as code, but actually written. You can see that there's lots of states going back and forward. Uh, this here is my fast state going across. This is my slow state going across. It also has to handle, basically what I realized was I need to handle slow state going away. So I mapped 11 was going left versus going right, so I could easily work out. So 12, 13, 14 are the slow states going left as much as the fast states. So it sort of mirrors this bit of the program on both sides. Um, and then we've got the midpoint finder. At the end, you've got everything becomes a right or a left hand general, which means it can go to bang. The number six is basically just to allow it to pause and flick one routine. I found I had to do that, otherwise it didn't quite work. But I had to use two states here because otherwise it would forget the left or right hand general. And also my solution only works for uh, multiples or powers of two. So it works on 16, 32, 64 and so on, 128. 256, it will work for all those combinations, but it won't work for 255, for example, because I have a bit of a problem with the mid state. I did try to solve that, I talked about that in my blog post, um, and I think I could solve it with a few more states. There's just a couple more states I need to solve to be able to handle an odd number. Once I've handled an odd number once, it will work. I had a near solution at one point, but basically, if I had an odd number, one side would fire one turn before the other side, and my program was horrendously messy, so I got the whole thing and built it from scratch. So you see, this is a very symmetrical program uh, with these fives and fifteens going as well. The program is basically it, it, two halves: one to make it go left, one to make it go right. Find the midpoint, subdivide, subdivide, subdivide until there's no more subdividing to be done. At that point, you know to fire, and everyone fires. Nice, neat solution, but not the fastest. You might think, why is it not the fastest? And it's because you have to wait for a slow pulse to make it all the way back. 
So this is basically always going to work on, I think, 6n speed. 6n minus 2, 6n plus 2, something like that. Uh, because you're waiting for that 3 speed pulse to go away across, and that 3 speed pulse, uh, no, actually, I lied. It's going to work on 3 speed, because you have to wait for 3 speed to go all the way across. You don't have to wait for the 3 speed to come back. It will go back because it bounces off the middle, but um, it doesn't go all the way back to the cross. It doesn't really put and back again. Um, so can you go faster? This is the fundamental question. The answer is yes, you can. Uh, and this is what uh, Goto invented, was he invented a method of going even faster. The solution is the same. Find the midpoint, subdivide, find another midpoint. But instead of sending a speed one signal all the way over here and bouncing, he basically spent another slow signal, so you've got your speed 1 signal, your speed uh, 3 signal, another speed signal to get to this point. So the point, the time to get to here will be 1 unit, 1 unit, 1 unit and a half unit. So this is um, 1.75 across to this. So it's about, uh, I have to do the math there, 5, speed 5 I think it is, and then this one I think will be speed 7. Um, so basically your, your signals going down here let you find these midpoints and you'd want to send an even slower one as well. Similarly from here you spend your speed 1, your speed 3 and your speed 7 and allows you to find this point. So the time delta between the solution I presented here and the solution here is significant to get the same number of subdividings is this much time. I, it's found two more subdivides before this 1 and 3 sets, uh, only 1 and 3 has found the second subdivides. It's significantly faster if you send multiple signals through. So you can optimize this by sending more speed signals. You may not decide speed, you may, I'm just going to take the speed benefit by bringing that speed down. The more slower signals you send, because I think it goes, I don't sure what the next one, the next one will be 9 or 11, I'm not sure. If it's always two more slower, you could just build states to send a new type of signal every time, and you could optimize your states. Um, and I suppose this is why he, his solution took thousands of states. It wasn't really optimised, but it was a good first start. So you can optimise this, you can start making faster solutions, which actually come down to 2n. And the reason it's 2n is because you only always that time one signal to go all the way across, the time one signal gets all the way back until just shy of this level. So this would be a 2n minus 2 type solution. We know you can't do it with four states but we don't know if you can do it in five. I think the current record is eight states to do this sort of solution in. So that's where we are. We now have a, a dancing robot um, with a solution, and it works for any size solution. So um, I can run that again. No, I was drawing by one. I best you let me run my program. Um, uh, if I change the number, it, it, it will run every time because the state machines, because the inputs are the same, it will run the same every single time. If I change the number in here to being 64, just to make sure I haven't cheated and I haven't carded it, uh, my army side there is 64. I'm going to uh, make it run a bit faster now, run at 15 frames a second. Save my program. Uh, my, my script will run at that rate. You sort of see the signals going across. Um, and you see this picture on the left hand side, I'm actually only printing out the first character of the state, so you may see some 1s which are actually 10s or 11s or 12s, or but you can see the 5s are going back, it'll bounce and then we get that second, and now because I've sold it for 32 already, I know this is now just solving it for 32, which we've already seen the solution for, and then it bounces, 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 and everyone fires at the same time. Um, but it will solve it for even larger, so if I want to make my robot size 128, um, oop, then it will work for that as well. An awful lot of robots now. Um, it's just saying, can I solve it now from trade? It means, well, yes, can I find the midpoint, break in half, which means I've got 64s. I know the 64 solution works. It'll work every time. My robots get very tiny at this point. Effectively, what we now have is a state machine of uh, robots um, which will do our bidding and will shoot people upon command. It just might take a little bit of time for them to synchronize doing it. As I say, the real world applications of this are things like mesh networks, booting up buses of networks, uh, where you want to say, uh, if forget the state machines, but use this signal passing to say, actually, you're in the middle. Without enumerating every single one, without actually getting every single one an address. Maybe you want to give them an address, maybe you want to promote one to be a controller. Maybe you just want to find the midpoint of an unknown number of things. Um, this sort of trick allows you then to use that in other types of programs. 
so I think there is a, a, a place in the world for solving these puzzles and making your, your brain think. Um, and it's great. I, I, I will make, I might come back and fix this problem so it does work for odd numbers. Uh, but I think I'm pretty much done this problem now. I think I've over-solved it. I've over-engineered my solution. Um, more when he sets out the problem, when he publishes the problem for the first time, he actually says you can solve this in a bit of paper and graph. And you can. You're basically drawing these patterns and thinking what the states are in between. So you're basically drawing the pattern on, on paper and saying, yeah, these are this is what's going to happen. These are the edges of my states. And you can start visualising those. And certainly that, that did happen. I did that after I'd already done it in my head and gone, yeah, that's the signal going across. It's going to collide the signal. When you start printing out generation after generation like this, you do see that those graphs come out. Um, you can do that with a 2D cellular automation very easily. If you're starting to do things like Conway's Game of Life, which is a, sorry, well, one, a, a, an array, if it's a two-dimensional one like Conway's Game of Life, it becomes harder to graph that over time. Uh, but there is, cellular automation is a really interesting topic, um, and it's led to the computers that we have today. You know, it's led to the sort of situation we have. It's led to how we think about networks and bus networks and so on. Anyway, that's all for me to say. As I said before, if you enjoy this video, please hit like and subscribe. Also, feel free to leave me a comment and feed the YouTube algorithm. I will be eternally grateful if you do that.